and welcome to Namio's Corner, where we explore the best, the worst, and the incredibly mediocre in religious art and culture. Thus far on this show, we've looked at media produced by major companies. But what about independent artists? Hollow is a Christian movie produced by a tiny company called Vine Media Group on a budget of about $2,000. It tries to present a story that's a little more grown up than most Christian movies and wants desperately to be a film that doesn't shy away from the gritty reality of life in the inner city. Which is kind of hilarious when you consider that if this movie had been rated, it would have garnered a PG at the most because it is deathly afraid of showing anything that even borders on explicit and none of the hardened gang members, drug dealers, cops, strippers, or drug addicts in the movie ever swear. The trailer and promotional materials for the film present a simple premise. Without God, people's lives are hollow. So how does the movie present this idea? Let's take a look. The movie opens with two of our main characters, Jordan and Quincy, meeting up to talk about dealing drugs. I got me this little referral. You new fools in town. They got the coins and the habits to profit from. I just need to fill them out on a little deal. Get them to trust me. Then we in, but I will need your help. Yo, yeah, man, you got some extra stuff I don't know about? Nah, man, I'm going through Copernicus. Get used to the awful dubbing because it is this way through the entire movie. And while it's competent in that it's rarely out of sync, it never starts to sound natural. The lack of background noise gives the film this weird, sterile tone, and because the dialogue was recorded separately, the actor's tone of voice always sounds just slightly off. Next, we're introduced to Harrison, an ex-con who recently completed his parole and acts as the token Christian of the story. His plan is to go back into his old neighborhood to try and influence others not to follow the path that led him to prison. Meanwhile, at a strip club wittily called The Club, Quincy meets up with our bad guy, Copernicus, and sets his plan in motion. He asks Copernicus for extra drugs, promising that he has a buyer and can turn a 40% profit within a few days. Copernicus agrees to the deal with as much menace as he can muster. I ain't playing. If this don't go down, I find myself without product, you find yourself without my money, we cease to be friends. If I thought you were my friend, I just don't think I could bear it. We then join Sam and Natalie, two narcotics detectives who are on a stakeout. They're in plain clothes rather than uniforms, but they're also wearing their badges prominently, meaning that any criminals who happen to pass by would recognize them as cops immediately. But lucky for them, the criminals in this area are stupid and they're able to witness a drug deal. Later, Jordan meets up with Chelsea, one of his customers, on a sunlit bridge in the middle of a lush green park. Yeah, it's nice in a creepy sort of way. They could totally film a slasher movie here. We're going to find out shortly that Chelsea works as a stripper, a profession that necessitates working under occasionally creepy conditions with frequently creepy clientele. So, yeah. This reaction to being in sunlight makes no sense anyway, but it makes even less sense when you know what she does for a living. We then cut back to Copernicus, who meets up with a man that the movie desperately wants us to believe is Russian. You want Freddy should get you a drink. Vodka. Neat. Ring bottle. Russian guy is here to negotiate with Copernicus. He wants Chelsea to do a porno, but she has repeatedly told him no. Russian guy, however, is not willing to give up. At some point in the past, Chelsea did a photo shoot for him, and those pictures have made enough money that he's willing to make a deal with Copernicus that is frankly insane. Whatever she make you in one year, we had 20%. Copernicus agrees to the deal. Of course he agrees to the deal. Who wouldn't? He's basically being bribed an absurd amount of money by an insane idiot with deep pockets to fire one easily replaceable employee. There is literally no downside. Quincy makes an appointment to sell the extra drugs he has, but as he's on his way to meet his contact, a bunch of guys surround and rob him. 
Sam goes home after work. He looks in on his wife, Sheila, who is pretending to be asleep. Then he goes into the other room to masturbate to internet porn while she lays in bed looking sad and distressed. If you didn't want him to go masturbate, why did you pretend to be asleep? If you know that's what he does when he's bored and alone and you don't want him to do it, all you have to do is sit up and talk to him. This is not rocket science. Copernicus talks to Chelsea. He tries to persuade her to take Russian guy up on his offer, but she refuses. I'm not a slut. I'm certainly not going to be some DVD whore. You need to take a minute. Take a day. Take two. Think about it. I am a dancer. Outside of that, there's nothing to think about. Presumably on another stakeout, Sam confides in Natalie. I go to work. I come home. I go to bed. It's the same thing every single day. It's like one day she just flipped from hot to cold. Well, there's something between all of that. Like what? You sound like a guy who's hiding something. Yes, because whenever a wife is angry at her husband, it's always because he did something wrong. And he must know what it was. Because that's always how it works every time without exception, because every single couple in the world is Peter and Lois Griffin. They do try and force this to make sense later on in the conversation by having Natalie tell Sam that she can tell he's hiding something so his wife can probably tell too, which is something we'll just have to take her word for since Sam can't act his way out of a paper bag. For me, that doesn't make up for reinforcing a stereotype by automatically assuming that Sam was in the wrong because he's the man in the relationship and the man is always wrong. Sam tells Natalie that he thinks it might have something to do with Sheila's sister still being missing. The sister ran away shortly before their wedding and he's been looking for her ever since. He thinks that maybe Sheila blames him for not having found her sister yet, but Natalie thinks it must be something else. We find out what that something else is in my favorite part of the movie. This scene manages to pack so much stupid into such a short period of time, it becomes amazing. everything about this scene. I love that they tilt the camera so that you can't tell what he's looking at. I love that you can clearly tell when they're shooting him from behind that his hand is on his desk and not in his lap. I love that when Sheila walks in, she's not only halfway across the house, she's looking at the back of the monitor and therefore couldn't possibly see what he's looking at. I love that he apparently doesn't know this and acts like he's been caught red-handed doing something awful, even though he would have had plenty of time to just close the browser before she came over to the computer. I love the exaggerated way he stands up, the way the chair gently wafts to the floor, and the fact that him knocking over the chair was clearly done in a separate shot that doesn't line up with him standing at all. I love that if he had been masturbating, by standing up, he just flashed her. I love that she doesn't say a word, but just gives him the stink eye and slams the door. I love that he stands there looking like a shell-shocked idiot. And finally, I love the music that plays throughout this scene, which tries so hard to convince us that something exciting is happening and fails so miserably. To take a situation that would be a complete non-event in the real world and turn it into this unintentionally hilarious, schlocky melodrama where she catches him in the ultimate act of betrayal is nothing short of beautiful. Jordan meets up with Quincy, who tells him about the drugs being stolen. Perkins don't play around, he'll straight up murder you. Man, do I look like this is a joke to you? I know this. Man. 
There ain't nothing left to do but run, hide, and pray. Why haven't you left town yet? You just said that you'll probably get killed and your only option is to run. So why are you standing around feeling sorry for yourself instead of running? Chelsea confronts Copernicus at the club. He's started to short her pay, tells her that she's quote-unquote forgetting her place, and threatens to give the prime dance time that Chelsea gets away to someone else. After she leaves, he calls Jordan in and tells him to replace Chelsea's usual cocaine with a different unnamed drug. Jordan agrees, but doesn't look too happy about it. Sam and Natalie see Quincy make a drug deal, and they chase him down and arrest him. As Quincy is being loaded into the cop car, one of Copernicus's goons drives by super slow. Natalie confronts Sam and asks him what's been bothering him because apparently he's been acting different somewhere off screen. He tells her that he found his sister-in-law while he was searching for porn online. It turns out that the sister-in-law is Chelsea and he found her through the photos that were mentioned earlier. Wait, 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 wait. Chelsea is the one he's been looking for? She ran away and she's been missing for two years. But she never left town and she never changed her name. Then she started working at a strip club run by a known drug lord. In all that time, her police detective brother-in-law who works narcotics could not find her until he started randomly searching for porn in his downtime. Sam is the worst cop ever. But the shoddy police work isn't what annoys Natalie, it's the fact that he's been surfing for porn. She tells him that he needs help in order to stop watching porn and says that she and her ex broke up because of porn. Just, I couldn't stand the thought of me being out of the house and him looking at pictures of women doing I had no idea. We'll get back to this pile of stupid shortly. Chelsea comes to Jordan for her usual, and Jordan gives her the drugs from Copernicus. What's wrong? You look like your world came crashing down. Based on all of the emoting that you are doing, it is clear that you are deeply distressed. Harrison is handing out flyers on the street when he meets Jordan. The two of them discover that they both know Quincy, and Harrison convinces Jordan to take a flyer. Chelsea finds out that her bills are all past due and her bank account is overdrawn, so she takes some of her new drug, which causes some crappy special effects to happen. Sam goes home and tells Sheila that he found a lead on Chelsea, and because he's a moron, he tells her how he found it. Sheila, predictably, freaks out, but not because her sister is doing porn. That part doesn't seem to phase her at all. Here's her real issue. I was beginning to think I was the problem. And I'm not pretty enough. Do you have any idea how degrading it is to pretend to be asleep in the other room when you're in here looking at this mutt? This is the part of the review where I take a look at this movie's stupid, stupid attitude towards porn. First, I want to say that pornography addiction is a real thing. It doesn't appear in this movie, but it is a real thing. Like any substance or behavior that stimulates the reward center of the brain, it's possible for a person's relationship to porn to become destructive and compulsive to the point where it gets in the way of their daily lives. Furthermore, given that the pervasive nature of online pornography and the ease with which it can be accessed is a very recent historical phenomenon, the effects of sustained porn use over many years of a person's life is only beginning to be understood. In recent years, researchers who study sexuality have seen a trend where young men who grew up masturbating to internet pornography develop erectile dysfunction issues when they finally become sexually active. These men find that because their sexual energy and activity has, up to this point, always been tied to pornography, they have trouble becoming aroused without it. These are real issues that are tied to the overuse of internet pornography. That said, 
Pornography, like masturbation itself, is not inherently good or inherently evil. When it comes to the making of porn, there are legitimate concerns about ethics, especially when it comes to age or human trafficking, but pornography that is made legally and out in the open rarely has these issues. There's even evidence that people who freely choose to be adult film actors find their lives to be more satisfying and even more spiritual than the general public. When problems arise in the use or overuse of pornography, it's not because porn itself is bad, it's because we as a society don't feel comfortable talking about it, and so a lot of people wind up with skewed perceptions of what porn is, what it's for, and how to use it in a healthy way. Which, believe it or not, is possible. In Hollow, the issues in the relationship that Sam has to both Sheila and to porn have nothing to do with the nature of porn or the nature of masturbation. The problem has to do with communication. Sam hasn't talked to Sheila about his porn use, and she hasn't talked to him about how she feels. Because of this, she has jumped to some wildly stupid conclusions, and because he doesn't know how to communicate, he hasn't challenged those conclusions. The primary stupid conclusion that Sheila has jumped to is that Sam's use of pornography has anything at all to do with her. This is a somewhat common mistake made by women who are in relationships but have little to no experience with pornography. And it grows out of a fundamental misunderstanding of how the human brain works. For example, if a woman spends time gushing over Twilight, obsessing over Fifty Shades of Grey, or drooling over some random Hollywood hunk, neither her friends nor her significant other are going to jump to the conclusion that she's dissatisfied with her current romantic partner. They'll just assume that it's a hobby or a way to relieve stress. And yet, when it comes to a man's use of pornography, which falls under the exact same category most of the time, Christian women in particular have this urge to assume that just because masturbation is involved, it means that the man is unsatisfied with his partner. Some even go so far as to call masturbating to pornography infidelity. For the record, this attitude is not only insane, it is incredibly hypocritical. I can promise you that a majority of the women who call using pornography cheating have a much, much deeper physical and emotional attachment to Edward Cullen than any man has ever had to any woman in any porn. Which brings me to the real root of Sheila's problem with Sam's porn use. It has absolutely nothing to do with anything he's thinking or feeling because she has no idea what he's thinking or feeling, nor does she care. The real issue here is her insecurities. The idea that she needs to compete with the women in his porn doesn't come from him, it comes from her. In fact, in relationships where this comes up, I'd venture that 99.9% .9 of the time, it never even occurs to the man that his partner might feel this way because it would never occur to him to feel like he needs to compete with the men in her fantasies or fictions. Because that would be crazy! Masturbation is, at its heart, a sexual relationship you have with yourself. It's the first sexual relationship most people have, it's easily the most important one in their lives, and it's one that's healthy to continue once they start having a sexual relationship with someone else. Asking a partner to give up their sexual relationship with themselves just because they've started one with you is nonsensical, unfair, and unhealthy. No one can sexually fulfill a partner all of the time, and no one should try. But to know that your partner is unfulfilled and to demand that they remain unfulfilled just to placate your own unfounded insecurities is not only insane, it's sadistic. If you want to pick on porn, pick on the fact that there are millions of people out there who do not understand that pornography is carefully packaged entertainment and not an accurate depiction of normal sex. 
Pick on the bad acting. Pick on the creeps who refuse to watch any pornography where the actors wear condoms. In other words, pick on problems that actually exist instead of paranoid fantasies created in the minds of insecure women who do not understand basic human sexuality. Sam and Natalie interrogate Quincy, who rolls over on Copernicus pretty much right away. Meanwhile, one snort of unnamed superdrug has turned Chelsea into a desperate junkie overnight. That is not an exaggeration, by the way. It has been less than 24 hours in movie time. She meets up with Jordan, who is horrified by the change in her and refuses to sell her anything, especially when she implies that she's offering sex in exchange for more drugs. What if we worked it out some other way? Like how? How do you want it worked out? Come on, Jordan. At least I know you. It's not that big of a deal. That's right. One snort of unnamed super drug made her go from this... And I'm certainly not going to be some DVD whore. ...to this. What if we worked it out some other way? Maybe this drug's street name should just be Plot Convenience. They argue, which ends with Chelsea punching Jordan and him walking away without giving her anything. Defeated, Chelsea returns to Copernicus and agrees to start doing porn in exchange for more plot convenience. Meanwhile, Sam continues to prove that he's the worst cop in existence by telling Quincy that they're letting him go in exchange for his promise to testify against Copernicus, but not offering to give Quincy any kind of protection whatsoever. This goes about as well as you might expect, as Copernicus's goons capture Quincy centimeters from the police station. Copernicus kills Quincy, and by coincidence, Jordan witnesses it, but doesn't get spotted by anyone. So, yeah... Minutes after finding a credible witness willing to testify against a major drug lord, Sam and Natalie have just gotten him killed. How these two have managed not to get themselves killed due to sheer stupidity completely eludes me. Jordan tells Harrison about witnessing Quincy's murder. He then pulls out a gun and says he's going to kill Copernicus. One side note here. If you're going to make a low-budget movie where every single tiny bit of the sound is dubbed over, and you decide to go to the trouble of actually doing a little bit of foley work, and in one of the scenes one of the characters is handling a gun, maybe don't do the foley with something that sounds like plastic, since guns are made out of metal. Harrison convinces Jordan to go to the police because that worked out so well for Quincy. At the police station, Sam and Natalie continue to suck at their jobs, deciding to take Jordan up on his offer to wear a wire and confront Copernicus to try and get a confession, rather than doing any actual police work or looking for evidence or any of that other stuff that cops who are good at their jobs actually do. We're two halves of a whole idiot! Chelsea goes to perform at the strip club, but a combination of shame and all the plot convenience she's been snorting causes the CD of audience noises she's dancing to to switch tracks. She runs out and Copernicus tells a henchman to go after her. Sam and Natalie drive Jordan and Harrison to the club because when you're about to send the only witness to a homicide into a building run by a drug lord, the best plan of action is to have a couple of known narcotics officers drop him off. Jordan notices the picture of Chelsea Sam keeps by the rearview mirror and asks if Sam is a fan of hers. Where you know her from? She dances at the club for Copernicus. Keep focused. What's going on? Well, Jordan, what's going on is that Sam and Natalie are such bad cops that they need a massive coincidence in order to solve anything at all. Also, what's going on is that both of them now recognize that this case just became a huge conflict of interest for Sam, and they're both going to choose to ignore that because they are bad at their jobs. 
Jordan goes in and confronts Copernicus in the dumbest way possible by trying to provoke him into threatening to kill him. Because the plot says so, this strategy works, and he's able to trick Copernicus into admitting to Quincy's murder, at which point the cops pour in. As they're arresting him, Sam shows Copernicus a picture of Chelsea and demands to know where she is. I will end it for you right now if you don't tell me where she is at. Um, Sam, are you aware that you just threatened to kill a suspect in the presence of other police officers? Because in the real world, not only is that a felony, but it, along with your conflict of interest, is going to prevent Copernicus from being convicted. Congratulations, you have just single-handedly destroyed any hope of keeping this dangerous criminal behind bars. Chelsea gets to her apartment and starts packing a bag, but the henchman interrupts her. Get over here now, shut up! Shut up! Why are you telling her to shut up? She is literally not making a sound. And by literally, I actually mean literally. The actress didn't dub anything for this spot. Sam magically gets there at the exact right moment, subdues the henchman in a spectacularly poorly choreographed move, and saves the day. Sam dutifully delivers Chelsea to Sheila, who hugs her sister while completely ignoring the husband who saved Chelsea because she's a horrible person. The two then retreat into the house, leaving him in the cold without so much as a thank you while they commiserate inside. If it weren't for Sam, how did he find me? They found you! Through the magic of porn. Eventually, Sheila comes back outside. Thank you. Whoa, lady, calm down. Your enthusiasm is overwhelming. It was exactly as if you were physically cheating on me. You have no idea how much... How much it hurt me. How am I supposed to trust you again? Maybe just one day at a time. I already hated this character, but this scene makes me hate her even more. This woman is so wrapped up in her own petty insecurity, she can't focus on anyone or anything else for more than a few seconds. Sam just basically pulled a miracle out of thin air and brought her estranged sister home, saving Chelsea's life in the process. And all this stupid cow cares about is the fact that he sometimes watches porn. If it were me, I would have dumped her long, long ago. But Sam has proven multiple times through this movie that he is too stupid to breathe, much less make rational decisions. The movie wraps up with Chelsea deciding to go into rehab for a while and Jordan deciding to stop selling drugs and look for a real job. In the final scene, labeled as being one year later, Harrison reads to Copernicus from the King James Bible in the most monotone voice he can possibly muster. He that saw it to his flesh shall the flesh reap corruption, but he that saw it to the spirit shall the spirit reap life everlasting. Hallelujah, Lordeth, we know us that thou art us hearest, because us, Lordeth, you love us, thy children us, Lordeth. Harrison sets the Bible on the table, and we end with a shot of Copernicus picking it up, implying that he will follow in Harrison's footsteps. So that was hollow, and wow does it suck. Given its minuscule budget, I can forgive the technical errors and even the awful quality of the dubbing, but that's not this movie's core issue. The core issues of this movie are the awful writing, the awful stupid characters, and the terrible acting. These issues cause the message of the movie, which is dumb anyway, to get lost under an avalanche of stupidity to the point where the only way to even discern that there is a message is to look at the movie's promotional materials. It's not unusual to find a Christian movie that's bad, but it is kind of unusual to find one that is this incompetent at conveying a basic message and story. I'm Namio, and the deepest sincerity cannot excuse bad art. There's gonna be
You have to pace yourself. Do something else besides look at pornography. What kind of a life is that?